Well, hey there. Welcome back to another episode of the Pursue Your Spark podcast. I'm your host, Heike Yates, and I am so excited that you're here with me today for another amazing interview. Before we dive in to today's episode, I would love it if you left a review on the Apple podcast. This will help the show to be found by many more women. Today's show is about slow living and a sustainable lifestyle. Slow living and sustainable living has become a big movement, not only in the United States, but around the world. It has become more important than ever to live simpler and strengthen our connection to each other and the earth. So join me in my interview with a mother and daughter team that teamed up seeking independence from existing food and fashion systems that are harmful to the planet and its people. Hi there, you're listening to the Pursue Your Spark podcast. I'm your host and fitness warrior, Heike Yates. And on this show, we empower women over 50 to take back their health and strength with sound fitness, nutrition, and mindset strategies. Our guests on the show share their honest stories so that you'll have the courage to take action, knowing that you're not alone in your struggles. Today's guest is Mary Kingsley. She's the co-owner of Lady Farmer. Lady Farmer is a sustainable apparel and lifestyle brand. Mary and her daughter, Emma, the other half of the brand, say that at Lady Farmer, we believe that the answer to healing ourselves and our planet is right under our feet. They are also the host of the podcast called The Good Dirt. Welcome to the show, Mary. Hi, how are you, Heike? I'm doing well, thank you. We're in, as we're recording this, we're in the midst of the coronavirus still, even though guys, you guys will hear this a lot later. So I want to know from Mary how life has been. Well, we're out here uh, on our little farm, just about 20 miles west of D.C. Um, the biggest difference for me, for us, is that my husband um, is working from home now and not commuting into the city every day. But it's really been fine. Um, we have been just doing our work here and um, and cooking our meals and getting a lot of our, um, instead of like going out and shopping, a lot of our friends and local people have been delivering food to us from the local farms and so forth. So we really haven't had to go out very much and have been really, um, it's really been fine. We feel safe and we have um, plenty of food and we're healthy and so all is well. We're um, uh, also aware of other people that are suffering and having a hard time and have lost their jobs and our heart goes out to all those people. Yeah. So. We're doing fine over here too. I mean, it's, it's a little confining, but it's like you, everybody's healthy and we have plenty of food and we're cooking up a storm these days. Yes. Yeah. A lot of good meals. Yep. <laughs> I guess, you know, we have more time to plan about what we want to eat and cook yeah. it. And, uh, yeah. So Mary, tell our listeners, who are you, where you're from and where did you start with develop your story? Tell them, tell us wherever you want to start. Yes. Well, um, I grew up in a small town and um, so I had a lot of freedom as, as a child and um, grew up running around in the woods and the ravines and the creeks and so forth. And so I always um, felt very comfortable outside and in connection with nature. And then as I grew up and, um, you know, went to college and, uh, got a job and got married, found myself living in, cities with you know Atlanta New Orleans and later on Washington DC always felt like I really wanted to be out more and have that a little piece of land where I could be immersed in nature and play outside with a gardener or growing things or whatever um, so this was always kind of a pull for me um, I studied in school I, I studied English literature and then later on became a children's librarian and so I worked in the education system for a while and I as, as I went through um, the education system and then had my own children got interested in a lot of environmental 
education and teaching children about nature and, and um, trying to take care of the environment and that sort of thing. So my, um, my personality and my passion sort of came together in kind of a, just an interest in nature and environmental interest. You, you was, uh, used to live in Tennessee, is that right? I grew up in Tennessee in a small town in East Tennessee. It was, uh, it was, it's right on the border of, of North Carolina and Virginia, and it's as far east of Tennessee as you, in East Tennessee as you can go. It's, um, it's really Appalachia, and uh, I had a really wonderful childhood there. Grew up around a lot of people that had, you know, grew up with the old mountain ways. And my father was a, a doctor. And in the early years, like in the 50s and 60s, he would still go see his patients up in the mountains. And um, I, I learned a lot from growing up there. Wow. That's, that's definitely old school that the doctor comes to you. I love this idea, though. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, those times are long gone, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you left Tennessee, you moved to, to the bigger cities. But what, yes. what drew you out of the city? Well, I always felt like I needed to be surrounded by more nature. I was frustrated by development and concrete. Um, in the 90s, when we moved from, um, we, we started out our married life in a, in a smaller town in Virginia, but then we moved to Atlanta. And it was a wonderful life there. Lots of just wonderful opportunities. But that was during the 90s boom, and there was so much development. We lived in the northern suburbs of Atlanta, and every time you looked around, you know, there were large tracts of land being leveled for the next shopping center. People were just moving in in droves. The, um, they were always having to add new schools so, because so many people were moving in. And so it just seemed like, humans were really taking over and, and nature was really having to take a back seat. And this, this affected me and it sort of fueled my desire to someday live in a place where I could be more in, immersed in nature and let it be and play in it and be in it. So How, you were living in Maryland now, which is close to where I live. How did you find this yeah. piece of land and, and what did your husband think about this? Oh. <laughs> That's a good story. Um, so we had moved from Atlanta to D.C. with my husband's job, and we um, found a really nice sort of townhouse-type situation in the city. And it was lovely. We really enjoyed it. Um, it, it was near the Sino you know, Canal. You could walk there. You could walk to restaurants and bank and haircuts and all those things you needed. So it was really delightful. I walked a lot every day. Um, I would go down the canal a lot, the CNO Canal. For those of you that don't live here, it's a it's a walking path that goes all along the Potomac River from Georgetown all the way up into way up into Maryland, and it's it's just a wonderful way to be outside um, in the city. So anyway, on weekends um, in the spring and summer, I found myself wanting every chance I got to get in the car and drive out here to where there they had all these pick your own farms and farmers markets and um, all these you know, back roads. And I just loved it. I was just pulled out here literally every weekend and like in blueberry season, I would get up early in the morning and come out and just pick tons and tons of blueberries and strawberries and peaches and cherries and every, everything is that came into season. I just would go and get tons of it and take it back to our DC house and, and start making things with it. And one day I was out there, it was in June. It was so beautiful. And the sunlight was just so perfect in the breeze. And I was driving along this road and the breeze was blowing the, the, the hay that had not been cut yet. And it was just, oh, it was a magical moment. And I thought to myself, there must be a place for sale out here somewhere, a place where we could live. And, um, went back home and started looking. And sure enough, I found the listing for this very house. And, and we came out and, um, and at the time my husband was working in the city. And so and the house had been on a market on the market for a long time. It was a very good deal. So the agreement was that uh, this would be like a weekend place. And uh, it was very rumbly, tumbly little farmhouse um, and a place to come on holidays where all the kids could come and be with us. And, 
And so that was, we, we went ahead, we went through it with it and we bought it, a little seven acre property. And um, it, as it turns out, like I never, I never really went back to the city. I, I was always finding a reason to be out here. Um, for the first year, um, my husband would come out two or three nights a week, but he stayed mostly in the city in our DC house to work. And then by the time a year later, we realized that this is where we wanted to be all the time. So we moved out here full time as our primary residence. And yeah, so I never really went back. Once, once, I, once we found this house and it was ours, I was here. <laughs> How old were your kids at this time? Let's see. Um, they were college age and up. I have three children. So um, yeah, the youngest was in college. And then the other two were either just finishing college or out of college. So yeah. So they had basically moved on. Yes, yes, pretty much. So it was not, not like, okay, they're going to elementary school or middle school or something. Yes, it was, it was, um, it was post child raising era, just barely though. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mary, tell me a little bit about how did Lady Farmer come about? Well, um, at that time, we, we've been here three or four years, and my daughter was just finishing up an internship in Boston. She had been there for a year, and she was sort of looking into what, what to do next. And um, she reached out to me and said, Mom, I, I have, I've just seen this, this documentary that really affected me. It was called The True Cost. I highly re recommend it to anyone out there that has never seen it. And it was about the problems in the, in the fashion industry. And she told me about it. And that really appealed to me because I had been also had in mind that, um, that, that I would like to design my own clothes, uh, design clothes that fit my country lifestyle and my age and the fact that I was outside all the time. And I really felt like there wasn't that much out there that I really wanted to wear. And then the more I learned about this fast fashion industry and the problems with it and the inequities and the toxins and the um, just all, all of the issues that it causes globally, um, we thought, well, well, we will design a line of sustainable clothing and um, make ourselves into a small company with this, this goal. And uh, we both simultaneously simultaneously thought of the name lady farmer because we're surrounded by young entrepreneurial farmers out here in the in the ag reserve um oh i should explain that th um, there's this area of montgomery county just outside of washington dc that's almost a hundred thousand acres of preserved farmland and that's where we live and um there are a lot of farmers out here and a lot of lady farmers so nobody can build uh, townhouses around you or anything like this? No, no, you can't build on anything less than 25 acres. Okay. It's really wonderful. But So we originally created Lady Farm as a sustainable apparel company because we were concerned about the crisis and we both had a desire to, to design clothes. Um, but then the more we got into it, the more we recognized the need for sustainability, um, education, and discussion for for all aspects uh, of, of life, for, you know, food and the products we use every day. So uh, we call ourselves a sustainable apparel and lifestyle brand because we talk about all of those things all the time and we do a lot of education on those things. Yeah. So when you and Emma got together, mother and daughter, in a new business venture, yes. tell me more about it. So you guys said, we're going to do Lady Farmer and what happened next? Well... <laughs> things happened really quickly um uh you know we got our we got our company name we got all set up legally and our accounts and all that and then emma's internship had ended so she actually moved home she moved back to the farm and so we began that way and um you know truly we, we did not know what we were doing or where to begin we just had this idea mm -hmm. but um as sometimes things happen when you're on the right path, people show up to help you and advise you and or give you just that thing that you need to take the next step. And so um, 
we ran into people that would help us with one thing and another. We, um, we got someone to help us with a Kickstarter campaign to help us fund this, this line of clothing we created. And then, and then, oh my goodness, like, how do you design clothes? We knew nothing. We, uh, you know, got on the phone. We got on Google and looked up manufacturers and got on the phone with people. And I guess we were kind of shameless. We said, uh, how do you do this? <laughs> but all along the way, I'll have to say this, people were always like really patient and, and shared their information with us. And no one ever said, oh, you're crazy. You don't know how to do this. Or, oh, you don't have a design degree. You can't do this. No one ever said anything like that. No, no one we encountered in, in step after step of trying to find our way and trying to figure out what to do. No one ever made us feel like that we were reaching too far or bitten off more than we could chew. I mean, we always encountered just people that said, this is a great idea. Just go on, just go on to the next thing. Now, when you started the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. what does that involve and what does it actually mean? Because our listeners may not know what, what a Kickstarter is and what it's for and what the end result of it might be. Yes. Well, you know, you hear about people getting investors, um, you know, you have to go out and you have to get money because it takes money to set up all these things. And certainly it takes money to create a line of clothing. But there's an alternative to that now that's gained popularity in the last several years. It's, um, it's crowdfunding. And Kickstarter is, is one of the platforms where you can run a crowdfunding campaign. And this is where you solicit people. You get them interested in your project. You have to, you know, you have to pitch it in a way that people want to fund it and are interested. And they can give any amount of money, small amounts of money. And if you cast your net wide enough, it can add up to quite a bit. And um, it, I, would, I will say it took about a year to really do it right. First, we had to establish our brand. Um, we had to develop a presence on social media and however else we could, in person, whatever, just talking about it, going around, talking to people, meeting people. And then you um, tell them, you know, what it, what it is you want to do and why. And you, you get people interested. And they say, oh, I like this. I will support you. And then... So you set up the campaign and this, the Kickstarter gives you the whole platform and you, um, you tell them, okay, we're going to start the campaign on this date and it's going to end on this date. And you have a goal, a financial goal. And the way Kickstarter works is if you, you have to make your goal in order to actually get the funds. So you're highly motivated to make it work. Mm -hmm. So we were, and we did it. We had some wonderful help and we had a big launch party on the very first day of the um th that it opened that the campaign opened and we actually made over half our money that night and the rest of it came in very quickly over so the next you with two the days money, wait before the kickstarter did yeah. you have any products done that you could sell right away or did you have wait for the money produce content produce the, the pieces of, of clothing and sell them then how does that work now we had the pieces designed and we had developed prototypes to the point where we could have photographs so we could advertise and we could say, tell people, this is what we're doing. And you, people that um, contributed were rewarded with any level of these items. Like if you, if you contributed X amount of dollars, you might get a tote bag that we had. Or if you contributed this amount of dollars, you might get a garment. Or even if you contributed more than that, you might get two garments. Or then you could, you could get the whole package if you wanted. So there were levels of contribution. Um, and it was, it was like a pre-order. Like these things weren't created yet. But we had created the prototypes and we had photographs and say, this is what you're going to get. But we couldn't actually produce them until we had the funds. So it, it's like a pre-order thing. It wasn't, it's not really like selling the items. It's more like people contribute in return for. It's a little bit of a caveat yeah. about so it. you had the funds. You got your pre-orders out. What happened next? So then we, um, we, create, we manufactured the clothing. And that, that took several months. And so the Kickstarter happened from September to October of 2017 and so we actually were able to deliver the items in the summer of 2018 so that's how long it took to have them um 
manufactured, delivered to us. And then we went back through and delivered them to all the people that had contributed and earned these awards. Uh -huh. So then yeah. you delivered the, the items. And so you had somebody that was designing the items for you based on your specs or ideas? Oh, yes. We had everything was all ready to go. The, the patterns were made. The items were prototyped. They were ready. They were ready for production. All that they needed was, was you know, the funds to do it. How do you source your materials, Mary? Well, that takes a lot of, um, a lot of research, especially in this sector of sustainable clothing. And you have to decide what your parameters are. Do you want domestically uh, produced textiles or organically produced textiles or both? Or um, do you want things that are um, made in you know small factory, small maybe family owned company? So you you we had to determine what our parameters were. And um, so we found where we wanted everything American made, we quickly found that uh, not a lot of sustainable and organic um, fabrics made in the USA are available or any at all because most of the textile industry has left the United States in recent decades. So um, we just had to do the best we could. But our main goal was, um, you know, responsibly grown, like organic, not using harmful pesticides. And, and fairly manufactured, that there was no um, human exploitation in the manufacturing of the clothing. And another um, criteria we used was that we wanted things to be biodegradable. We didn't want any plastic in them. And um, that was a trick uh, in, in the design process. You know, no zippers, you know, buttons had to be wooden or whatever. But anyway, in answer to your question, where do you source your materials? You had to call around, you, you know, look around, find out about companies, call them, ask them questions. Where does it come from? Um, you know, where's, where is the, the, the material grown? Uh, what are the conditions in the factory where the textiles, you know, are actually made? Um, it, it took a lot of, took a lot of research. Are people in general willing to tell you what the materials are made of? I would say most people in this space are there because they care very much. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yes, and there's a point where you just, you, I mean, you have to trust what people say. I mean, yeah. short of getting on a plane and going to China to look at this or that factory where they say it was, uh, you know, there's, there's not much you can do. That's why, you know, the best case scenario, I guess, is to have things domestically made because then you have more, you know, more sight into actually what's going on. But there are people that, that do it in a good job, you know, all over the globe. It, it, the trick is just, you know, finding out where they are. So we use, you know, we use uh, organic cotton, we use linen, we use hemp. Hemp is mostly um made grown and the textiles are manufactured in china but we found a good source and it's really nice stuff and we and simultaneous to all this we were really working on um the campaign for hemp legalization in in, in maryland and um that has since come to pass and so we're oh looking goodness. forward yeah we're looking forward to um Someday it's quite a ways down the road because there's not a lot of there, there's almost zero infrastructure for processing the hemp these days. But um, when when that is all put back into place, uh, we look forward to having domestically grown hemp in our products. Yeah. That's a ways off. Of. When we originally talked and prepared for the interview, after we prepared, I looked through all my clothes and I'm like, what is this actually made of? Oh, good. Oh, I, you know, we, that's something we encourage our community to do. That's a really great exercise is to go through your closet and look at the labels and, and see what this stuff is made of and really decide what you want to be wearing. And anything that's like, you know, not, um, you know, cotton, linen, wool, and so forth, silk is, 
probably has plastics in it. I wouldn't wear plastic, but in reality, you're probably wearing plastic most of the time. Yeah, because once I looked at the labels and and uh, I found out that some of a lot of my clothes are a mix of whatever blend they are is in there. Yes. And yes. it's like, and now I'm getting some emails from these people that I bought the clothes from. And honestly, Mary, I'm, I'm like, I don't want to buy anything like this. After, after I talk to you, your yeah. influence. Yes. I mean, this really a rabbit hole you can go down. Like um, there's emerging research about, you know, what it means to actually be wearing plastic against your body. And um, it, it's a whole thing. Probably won't want to get into it now, but it's really something to think about. Now you have your clothing line. Is it for kids, adults, for men, women? What is the line about? What's your brand, lifestyle brand about? Okay. Our, our essential collection is this first line of clothing we developed. And it was five pieces. And I say was five pieces because um, we've almost run all the way through our first um, the first run of it, let's say. And um, we are now working on generation two, so to speak. We, we like the designs and we like how they turned out. So we want to continue with them, but just maybe update them and, um, you know, things that came up that we thought we could improve or we're doing that. Um, but since then, we have also brought in a whole new line of clothing. It's um, seven pieces from a company called Line and Toe. Um, this is, these pieces are also made from sustainable uh, textiles and manufactured um, very responsibly. And so we are the exclusive retail outlet for this line now. And you can see all of that on your, uh, on our website at ladyfarmer.com. And, um, those are, so now we have, we have, um, 12 pieces. They're women's wear, women's casual wear for all kinds of uses. Um, you know, inside, outside work, play, whatever. Now everybody wants things you can wear at home. <laughs> so these are definitely items you can wear at home. And and right now I'm wearing um, I'm wearing a piece that <clears throat> that we created. And if I may say so myself, I really like it. It's, it's the Demeter tunic, and it's it's I, I wear it all the time. It's three quarter sleeve, and it's really good for this kind of um, kind of cool weather. It's got giant pockets, so I love to wear it out in the garden and and around and you know i always know where my phone and my glasses are and um it's yeah it's, it's wonderful it's called the demeter tunic and oh, we have a few so left <laughs> listen in and go check it out on the website yeah yeah now mary you've coined i like to say coined the the term farm to closet tell the listeners what that means yes i'm not sure we created that um i think it i think it had been around but yeah we we definitely started using it and um well the term farm to closet it brings awareness to the fact that real clothes come from fabrics that are made from a plant or an animal and that what we call real clothes kind of like real food um you know don't have plastic in them they're not synthetics all these blends and things don't come from the ground um and so so plant so clothing is essentially an agricultural product and it needs to be raised as carefully and responsibly and as clean as our food because you're wearing it on your body um, and your skin is your largest organ and you do absorb things through your skin most definitely and so you you want the best you want the best fabrics covering your body and also we want to do things that are good for the environment. We want to consume in a way that is um, supportive of regeneration, not degeneration of the soil and the water on the planet. So when we talk about clothing as being farm to closet, it really makes people aware of that connection. I like that. Do you, yeah. And it's, it's like that's something, you know, that you might think about much like uh, that, that, oh, my, my dress here comes from a plant or it should, you know, well, we hope it, we hope it does <laughs> and not a lab. <laughs> yeah. So how do you support and connect with other lady farmers? 
Oh my goodness. Well, you know, we, uh, we live here in the Montgomery County Ag Reserve and which is a farming community. And, and many of the younger farmers are women these days. There's an organization called the National Young Farmers Coalition, and they state that 41% of farmers in their first 10 years of farming are women. Mm. And that the total number of female principal operators on farms has increased by nearly 70% in the last several years. So this is an interesting um, phenomena I think and and we really like it we really feel like the term lady farmer also um taps into that idea of a real kind of feminine energy you know like um uh you know mother earth and the, the women women have always been the creators and the nurturers and um we even named the, the pieces of the essential collection after goddesses like the Demeter. Like right now I'm wearing the Demeter tunic. Well, Demeter was the goddess of agriculture in Greek mythology. And she, she's the one that fed the world. So she's like the ultimate lady farmer. <laughs> ah, how interesting. I didn't, it didn't occur to me when you said this earlier. I love that. Yeah. And then we have the Persephone dress. Um, and Persephone was Demeter's daughter. And so we have this really this sweet little dress um, that, you know, and so the symbolism is, you know, the mother daughter thing and the goddesses. And um, so it's great. So we love the, the idea of the, the feminine energy of the lady farmer. And it's actually, it's, it's a real thing. Um, and then in, well, in terms of our lady farmer audience though, people, you know, you don't have, we like to make it clear that when we're speaking about lady farmers, we're, we're not talking to, only people that are that have land and are raising things on it. Um, we have a lady farmer audience, and these are people that are um, they they are interested in simple comforts. They're in, interested in tradition. They're interested in sustainability. They identify with nature and its cycles. They're really invested in change, um, and but not change where you know it's like like so so big that you don't want to do it it's change in a way that is accessible on a daily basis like choices in what you eat and what you wear and what you plant and uh, so when we're talking to lady farmers we just want to help people make their life simpler and strengthen their connections to each other in the earth and so that's what we mean when we say lady farmers any any woman who's interested in her own well-being and that of the planet that's a lady farmer. And how do we reach out and support these lady farmers? Um, well, just in this year, in 2020, uh, we've launched a podcast called The Good Dirt. We've published a book as The Lady Farmer Guide to Slow Living. Uh, we have started a slow living book club. And we also, we hope to continue offering the live workshops and retreats that we've done in the past for um, in 20. 18 and 19 we held a slow living retreat um in in the fall and it was a delightful experience where we taught workshops and people came together and we talked about the concepts of slow living and sustainability and um it was it's just been a wonderful event that we've we've been developing and don't know what's going to happen this year um hard to say but we have to continue doing that as well yeah. as other live events. Yeah. Can, so my, have, can my listeners find all this information on your website? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Ladyfarmer.com. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, and, Mike, I'm curious. So how is it working out between Emma and Mary? Oh, you mean as far as mother and daughter working together? Yeah. Oh, you know, it's, it's really good. Um, we've had to, you know, adjust to it and work through things. I mean, there is the thing of mother, daughter, and then business partners. Um, for the first little bit of Lady Farmer, she lived here, and then she got to the point where she could go and have her own place. So we actually don't see each other all that often. She lives in D.C., um, especially during the coronavirus. We haven't seen each other very much at all, but certainly there is daily contact. But there have been things, um, especially when she lived here, it was like, you know, we had to have very designated um, 
times when we were talking about Lady Farmer or when we were just being housemates, <laughs> you know, and so we had this kind of rule that, you know, before nine o'clock in the morning, we would, we wouldn't launch into it. And then at the end of the day, we were done and that took some practice. And then we've developed um, a rule that we have a, a special texting thread that's only for lady farmer things. And so we can t still have our personal like, Hey, you know, are you going to come out for dinner? That's on a separate text. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so we're, we've learned these little tricks and, um, you know, it hasn't been all smooth, but I'll say overall, you know, it's, it's just, it's been really good. We've had to adapt along the way. And that's, yeah, that's wonderful. Now, what are three steps that you would suggest to our listeners who, uh, that want to live a little slower and a more sustainable lifestyle that they could start saying, okay, this week I want to do these, start with these three steps that Mary said. Okay. Well, I think probably the biggest thing is just learning to pay attention to the decision, this, to the decisions that you're making in your daily life and how they make you feel. You tune into what you're doing and where you are and try to identify where it is that you're feeling the most stress or discomfort or where you're feeling like, I don't like this. And, um, and pay attention to the aspects of your life that bring you the most comfort and ease. And you just begin to make small shifts in these areas. And you want to bring emotional sustainability into your everyday life. You know, we're not just talking about, um, you know, what you eat and buy and all that. We're talking mainly about how you feel. So that's the first thing. Pay attention to that. For instance, we had um, over, the, over the winter, this is before all the quarantine started, but we did what we called this. Um, it was a five week slow living challenge. And every week the participants got an email with some prompts, things they could, um, they could uh, practice during the week, you know, if they wanted or not, whatever the choice was theirs. And on one of the weeks, um, the, one of the options was, Try to go a whole week without running any errands or buying anything. Now, this, this was before the quarantine. And I thought, nobody's going to do that. You know, that's just really hard. That's just really hard to tell someone not, not to go um, out for a week to get anything. Um, but I thought it was a good exercise in paying attention to why. Like, we're so, so easy to jump in the car and run, go do something and spend an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, you know, doing what – you know, buying things to bring into your home that you have to have a find a place for and deal with and all this. So um, just bring some aware, awareness to that, that pattern. And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, we were being told not to go anywhere. So I thought that was pretty amazing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, okay, that was number one. That was a long way of saying that, um, you know, just pay attention to where, where it is you think you need to go or what you need to do, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, the second one is pay attention to your consumer habits and where you can, and you can decide this for yourself. No one's going to judge or shake their finger at you, but you can decide where you can adopt a less is more approach to having and buying and just start paying attention and thinking about these things. Um, intention and thought are so powerful here because so many of our behaviors are unconscious and patterned and inculcated by the culture. And we don't stop to think about what we're doing or why. So this is what I encourage. Just pay attention, pay attention to your, when you feel good and not so good and pay attention to your consumer habits. And the third thing I would say is choose to eat and prepare real food this is food that's not processed. This is food that is as local and fresh as possible. This is food that hasn't been flown 3,000 miles in plastic boxes. Try to find these things and take the time to slow down and, and consume this for you and your family. That in itself will slow you down, just your food preparation, your food choices. Nice. And then acquire real clothing. Um, go through your closet like you did and, and look and see what they're made of. And you get to decide for yourself, what do I want to wear? What companies do I want to support? 
what materials do I want to um, keep, encourage the production of? Um, how about that fleece jacket that is made of recycled water bottles? Well, that might sound like a good idea. Those, those water bottles are re recycled. When in actuality, less than 1% of all plastic water bottles are actually recycled. Mm -hmm. And that um, the, the water bottles that are in the fleece jacket, every time you wash it, it releases microplastics that go into the water, that go into the ocean, that go into marine life. We're eating it. It's causing health problems. So you might have a fleece jacket. You might say, hmm, um, I already had this. I'll, I'll wear it till it's worn out, but I don't think I'm going to buy it again yeah. or I really like it. And, um, and also to be very discerning about the products that you use in every life, in, in your everyday life. You know, um, in our, our consumer um, economy, there tends to be uh, several products for one use. And it's really quite easy to flip that on its head and say one product for several uses. And you can transform your kitchen, your laundry room, and your bathroom with that philosophy. You can transform your kitchen, your laundry room, and your bathroom with like, like vinegar and baking soda, pretty much it. You can do just about anything with those. And so just start thinking this way and it'll, it will be like a pebble in the water. It will grow and expand. It's just like when Emma and I started out with sustainable clothing and it just sort of expanded and it hit all these areas until it became like an entire lifestyle. Yeah, I can see that that everything starts with awareness. Once you know, or you yes. are aware. I looked at my labels and I went, "Oh crap!" <laughs> yes, and it's just from literally paying attention, isn't it? Yep. And before I was like, "Oh, this looks really cute on me, and it feels kind of nice," and I didn't even look at what the blouse was made of. And then I looked at it and I'm going, "Ooh, that's definitely not anywhere in organic." So right. These yeah. are really good tips, but I have a couple of quick fire questions for you. Ready? Yes. What values are most important to you? Being genuine to who you are, being authentic, acting from a place that's truly you and in the best interest of um, humans, yourself, the planet, and honoring the connection of all living things. So I, I think just being real and authentic and honest and, and truthful in the way you live and act. What is one of your best habits? Um, I meditate every morning for 20 minutes. And I, I don't think I've missed a day in, in several years. <laughs> I'm, almost, I'm almost afraid, you know, if I don't, I don't know what the day would be like. And I don't want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so I meditate every morning, the first thing, and then I, almost every day, I take a good, a good long walk. Nice. Um, I love, I just love being outside and moving in nature. And um, yeah, so those are two habits that keep me literally grounded and, and, you know, make me feel like I've had a good day. What was the biggest risk you ever took? It might have been buying this farm. Yeah, I think so because uh, we were taking on a second property. Um, it was it needed a lot of work. Um, the dreams I had for it were like like it's crazy. I'm you know I've never done all these things, and I don't know what I'm doing. And I guess that sort of uh, relates to starting Lady Farmer. Like it was the same thing. Like you know we don't we don't really know what we're doing. I mean neither one of us had ever designed clothes. We didn't have, I didn't have experience in business. My daughter had taken one business course. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this whole, I guess, you know, the whole, the, what started with this farm and, and sort of um, led into starting Lady Farmer. What does it mean for you to stay healthy? Healthy in mind, body, and spirit. And um, like we were talking about sustainability, um, Sustainability means emotional sustainability as well. So uh, not living in a way that gets us off balance um, and, and in a physical way or daily stressors or um, things that, um, you know, make us feel um, just, you know, the word, the word dis disease comes from dis-ease, like not not at ease so 
whenever you're experiencing something that's not where you're not at ease, I know that's a that's a big area there, but then that can eventually lead to disease. So um, I think staying healthy is all about staying balanced in everything and, and being, uh, once again, being aware, being aware of what you're experiencing and how you can adjust to in a better direction. And it's easy for us to say, well, I can't, you know, I have this job or I have all these children or I have this, you know, I have a sick family member. And it's so true. We all have challenges in our lives and things that feel overwhelming but I think it's safe to say that there's always some little shift you can make to take that feeling of dis-ease back in the other direction so that it doesn't become disease what do you hope to achieve by sharing your story I hope that people that hear my story can can say hey I'm I really have always thought I'd like to do such and such but I feel like I'm too old or I've, I chose another path I would like for them to say, well, not, you know, don't give up on it. Just take it to the next step and see what happens. And you'll be amazed what doors might open. And, you know, we never know what's, what's down the road for, for us. Um, you don't need to be shutting doors. We need to be looking for doors that are ready to open for us, no matter what our age is or what our circumstances are. Um, this is an abundant life and the opportunities are infinite. And I think it's just our choice whether or not to move forward and, and pursue things that will make a difference to ourselves and, and the world. Lovely. Final question. Where can people reach you and Emma and learn more about you and Lady Farmer? Oh, thank you. Well, of course, um, our website, ladyfarmer.com. And then we are on Instagram at we are lady farmer. Uh, just spelled out, we are lady farmer. And um, on Facebook, lady farmer. And then we encourage people to subscribe to our podcast, the good, the good dirt. Um, you can find it anywhere where you get your podcasts and subscribe and leave us a review and let us know how you're liking it. And um, also, we've just published our book, The Lady Farmer Guide to Slow Living. You can buy it um, straight from our website. You can also find it on Amazon. And you can also um, order it through small independent bookstores. So we invite you to um, have a look at that and, and let us know what you think. And send us any questions or suggestions or just anything you want to say to info at lady-farmer.com. Perfect. We'd love to hear from you. We love, we love hearing from our audience. Our community is just our favorite thing about this whole adventure. We just meet the most wonderful, interesting, amazing, gifted people, and it just never ceases to amaze us. Um, and that's also how we met. And so I yes. get to hear the gift of the lady farmer because I wouldn't have known about you without having met you at the wine tasting, which we haven't talked about. But yes, <laughs> everything organic at the wine tasting. And I meet you and the lady farmer just was something I wanted to share with my audience. So Mary, thank you so much for being here, sharing all about lady farmer and sustainable living. And I wanted the uh, listeners to reach out to us and you just heard we are lady farmers on Instagram and Facebook. So reach out to us and to me at Heike Yates and the pursue your spark podcast. Let you know if you looked into your closet and what you found when you were looking. So let us know we're waiting for you here on the other end. So Mary, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me on and just letting me share it has meant so much thank you thank you